Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Fifty years later, many of us still feel the joys and despair we did in 1968 and wonder how different the world might have been without that year's tragedies. Lawrence O'Donnell, the host of The Last Word on MSNBC, is also a writer, most recently of a book about that year called Playing with Fire, the 1968 Election and the Transformation of American Politics. And today, he's my guest. Great Welcome. to be here, Ronnie. Right. right. It did transform it. I mean, I loved it, the year of 68, mm -hmm. up until June. Yes, yes. <laughs> because I was a big Kennedy supporter and had been for many months before. Um, and I loved reading the book because it was a book that I was, you know, a time when I was you so lived involved. This. I lived yeah. it, right. Uh, and I was thinking to myself, what does he mean how it changed? But it did. Oh, I mean, it, it allowed it, Nixon to become president, which started the conservative life and the conservative drive of the Democratic Party and landed us here, right? It transformed our politics in uh, uh, so many ways it takes yeah. a book to describe them. Right. But let me just begin with the first sentence of the yeah. book in which Roger Ailes I know meets Richard Nixon. In 1967, Richard Nixon's getting ready to run for president. Roger Ailes is the executive producer, very young executive producer in his 20s, of the Mike Douglas show, which people uh, who are around then will remember as a very light, Ellen DeGeneres kind of afternoon kind of, If you wrote a book, show. you went there. Yeah, if you in wrote a book, but if you were a singer or a comedian, you, you went there. Did. It was mostly light stuff. And Nixon is sitting there in the makeup chair and he starts complaining about why am I doing a silly show like this instead of Meet the Press. And Roger Ailes hears this and he just lights into Richard Nixon for 10 minutes about everything Nixon has gotten wrong about television throughout Nixon's career as a politician, how he lost the 1960 presidential campaign because he didn't understand television and he didn't understand the TV debates. And Nixon hears all of this criticism and he loves it because no one talks to the former vice president like this and he recognizes this guy is right, this guy really knows something and then Richard Nixon lures Roger Ailes into his 1968 presidential campaign and Roger Ailes never goes back to that kind of television. He goes on to elect, help elect Richard Nixon, uh, help re-elect Richard Nixon, helped elect Ronald Reagan, re-elect Reagan, helped elect George H.W. Bush, helped elect George H.W. Bush's son, uh, George <laughs> W. Bush, because by that time, by the time we get to the second Bush presidency, Roger Ailes has created Republican TV. He's created the Fox News Channel, which is the fundamental life support system every day of uh, Republican politics in America, now Trump politics. Uh, we would not have the president we have today if Richard Nixon had not lured Roger Ailes into the 1968 campaign because no one could have built Fox News the way Roger Ailes did, and without Fox News, we would not have a Trump presidency. Fascinating. All right, now we had other people, though, another cast of characters, right? What was interesting about Nixon and with Roger Ailes is that he could take criticism or suggestions from his staff. Lyndon Johnson was just the opposite, right? Exactly, yes. And that caused more problems because nobody wanted to tell him the truth. Richard Nixon was the most professional in every sense uh, campaigner in 1968. He, he created the model for what is the modern campaign, and that is, it's, first of all, it starts the year before. It really, if, in Nixon's case, it actually starts four years before, because he starts working on the 68 mm. campaign by the way he participated in the 1964 campaign, which he knew the Republicans were going to lose. And he very much wanted the Republican to lose so that it would be an open seat for presidency for so a Republican helped. to run so for. He did everything he could to help people in the Republican he Party. He wanted to look in 1964 like he was the greatest team player in the party, and he really did. And he was rewarded four years later mm -hmm. for that, uh, the, the way he behaved <laughs> in the 64 campaign. So he showed you the corporate model for doing this. Corporate 
models include long-term planning, like five-year plans. So his five-year plan was, I do everything I can for the ticket in 64 so that four years later, I am on that ticket at the head of that ticket. He started formally the apparatus of the campaign in 1967, you know, well uh, before any votes were ever going to be cast in New Hampshire in the, in the first primary. And that's what you see now. You see that the, the presidential campaign, they're out there campaigning. They're having presidential campaign debates now yeah. a year and a half before the votes are cast. They are for, they've formalized now what the, the process that Nixon, the model that Nixon created in, in 68. And the, you know, the second, uh, I would say the second most professional experienced campaign of 1968 was really the Bobby Kennedy campaign. But look at the way that started. It started very late. Uh, no one wants to use that model anymore. It started after the New Hampshire primary. No one would ever try to use that model again. Uh, and, and Bobby Kennedy's uh, campaign, the engine was fundamentally Bobby Kennedy. It was fundamentally, we have a giant, giant political star at the center of this campaign, and that's going to be the fuel of this campaign instead of very careful oh, corporate it planning. was even before he wanted to run. I mean, yes. You know, oh, well, he, plan, uh, uh, he had a plan, but it was in the future. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you know this and I don't, because I was in high school at the time, and so I was watching all of this that's in the book at the kind of, you know, in, in the theater seats. And so I had impressions of people. I thought Gene McCarthy was the hero because he was the one who stepped forward and said, I will run uh, to put Vietnam on the ballot, to put the war on the ballot. I'll be the peace candidate and I will run. And he bravely, uh, in my view, and I think everyone's view, goes up to New Hampshire and does phenomenally well against Lyndon Johnson. I thought he won the New Hampshire right, primary because the, the coverage was so <laughs> enormously favorable. Yeah. I'm telling you, it was decades later that I discovered he came in second. <laughs> to Lyndon Johnson in New Hampshire. But the idea that you could get over 40% against an incumbent president of your own party was unheard of. Bobby Kennedy comes in at the end of that week, and he looks to me like someone who's just exploiting uh, the success of Gene McCarthy. And I'm really torn because I'm a Boston Irish Catholic <laughs> boy who's watching another Kennedy one run for president, and I want another Kennedy presidency, <laughs> but now this doesn't quite look right. When I get into the research of this, I discover what you know, which is that Al Lowenstein and others were talking to Bobby Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy was talking to them about running for president a year before oh, yeah. he decided, right. and he went back and forth. I didn't know any of that background story of and how he, he came even to told, the And he even told that to McCarthy yeah. that he was planning. You know, yeah, and McCarthy knew it. Right, and, right. And McCarthy, it was no surprise. McCarthy actually wanted Bobby to run because McCarthy, he didn't like Bobby Kennedy, as we know, but he wanted the Vietnam War to be on the ballot. He wanted to give people a chance in the presidential primary election to vote on the Vietnam War. You can vote for the incumbent president who's running this war right. or a challenger to, to that war. And so, uh, you know, McCarthy uh, said, you know, you should get Bobby Kennedy. And, of course, they, the, <laughs> Al Lowenstein, who was trying to do this, uh, talked to Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy thought about it and broke Al's heart a couple of times by thinking sort of yes and then deciding no. Um, and then, you know, Lowenstein eventually, as you know, gives up on Bobby Kennedy and starts trying to I find I didn't want candidate. him to. We had a big argument about that. Oh, really? So oh, how yeah, did that definitely. Go? I went out to New I was out in Chicago. I well he went with McCarthy. Yeah. And I, I just said I know he's gonna run. And you were completely right. Yeah. He was consistently thinking right. about it all the way right. through. And and he was getting the word to McCarthy even before McCarthy Absolutely. won New Hampshire that he's going right. to do this. He's he was trying to get the yeah. word to him through Teddy, who had better relationship with McCarthy. Yeah. The, the, they're both yeah. uh, the all, all three of them affable. senators. I once asked Bobby why uh, he and Gene McCarthy didn't get along. He said, because Gene McCarthy knew more Thomas Aquinas than we do. But I, not being Catholic, didn't understand it at all. It's a fascinating <laughs> thing. I, I am intrigued by the tension between Gene McCarthy never and Bobby it. Kennedy, and it is way beyond tension. Here are these two Irish Catholic politicians who, on paper, are, resemble each other much more than they differ from each other. Uh, and what you see in Gene McCarthy was uh, this kind of raw, uh, nerved, racking sensation that he was getting by watching the glorification of the Kennedys and, and feeling that for all, for these to be the people who rise as the first great 
a Catholic family of politicians, an like Irish that. Catholic, was deeply disturbing <laughs> to, to Gene McCarthy, because Gene, Gene McCarthy genuinely was a devoutly religious Roman Catholic who actually studied for the priesthood yeah. at a certain point in time. And he saw the Kennedys as these libertine, right. uh, <laughs> you know, bad representatives of Catholicism, quite literally. And Gene privately said uh, once uh, about uh, Jack Kennedy that, that he said that he was uh, a better scholar, a better athlete, because of all this touch football stuff that the Kennedys used to get coverage of, that bothered McCarthy because McCarthy was actually a possible uh, Major League Baseball player and was scouted by the Major Leagues. Better Catholic, a, a, better, uh, a better athlete and a better scholar. He put all those things together. And you really have to have been alive in Irish American Catholicism in the 1960s to really know what he's talking about and what those values were. But you know, Jimmy Breslin wrote a book how the, how, uh, the church forgot Christ, about the church that forgot Christ. Mm -hmm. Jimmy would say, I think, that Robert Kennedy was essentially better a follower of Jesus, of helping the poor, of the empathy and sympathy and all of that. Gene McCarthy didn't have that. Yeah, the, the Gene McCarthy, um, the, the Gene McCarthy uh, <laughs> dis disagreement or stress about the Kennedy's Catholicism is unique to a very thin uh, a group of high-end Catholic intellectuals of the early 1960s. That thinking has become extinct, <laughs> and, uh, and and there was there was no one uh, outside of these Jesuitical sort of you know. Uh, chats that would that would understand what Gene McCarthy was was talking about and 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 that was the problem with Gene McCarthy ultimately is that he was too mm -hmm. wrapped up in things like that to be able to see clearly as a politician he had too many uh, kind of intellectual separators he would he would snap and and immediately turn on someone uh, if he just heard the wrong thing that made him that made him judge that person intellectually in a negative way. Uh, and he, he couldn't easily embrace the complexities of the personalities and the characters that you have to deal with in politics. And so he became very isolated as a senator, very isolated as a politician. And what became clear to me as I got into the, the full research of this book is that Gene McCarthy, especially as you see him headed to Chicago, was not the politician who could pull off uh, getting yeah. the Democratic nomination, therefore he couldn't get the presidency. Because getting the nomination is harder than getting the presidency. Getting the nomination is an inside mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. Bobby Kennedy was the one mm -hmm. who could have pulled off that nomination because he had done it before for his brother. And he was the, he was the full professional politician who understood everything about dealing with people you don't like, about dealing with people who you think aren't very bright. He could do all of that with a smile, with no problem, uh, and, and, and do everything you needed to do to get that nomination. So I, I actually believe Bobby Kennedy, after winning the California primary, was on his way to the yeah, nomination. Yeah, I, I agree. Especially because, especially because Hubert Humphrey was the worst presidential candidate we had ever seen up till that point in time. So and Bobby Kennedy staying in the race would have made Hubert even worse. It's sad to think that because he was such a well-intentioned person. Yes, he, I, I, Humphrey, right? I'm, I'm saying candidate. Yeah, no, now, having worked in government myself right. in the Senate, in general, in general, mm -hmm. my general rule uh, uh, that I made observationally in the Senate was the better you are at campaigning, the worse you are at governing. And the better you are at governing, the worse you are at campaigning because they are completely different skills. One is this external thing that's very kind of ego driven and performance driven and you know, how good are you at speech making? Kate Bobby Kennedy the was the first real rock star campaigner yeah. we ever had. He was the only one who could go out there in front of a crowd and create a sensation that we had only seen created in audiences by Frank Sinatra, mm -hmm. Elvis Presley, and the Beatles. It was mania. We'd never seen anything like that. And so that is an enormous cushion 
But that, that, are, that, are that wouldn't have happened based. without Jack Kennedy. No, because what you... What, I mean, how what, can you not have That's this? right. Uh, the, Jack Kennedy it's was tragic. not a rock star when no, he ran he for president. No, he wasn't. He was a good-looking guy who seemed very different from Eisenhower. And charming. And, and very different from his predecessors yeah. and, and charming. <laughs> and he seemed smart. But there wasn't this predisposition to love him yeah. because Jack Kennedy was not a tragic figure. Yeah. Bobby Kennedy was a tragic yeah. figure in American life. Yeah. Every time people people looked at him, they were seeing his dead brother. And the people who supported him were hoping for some kind of emotional restoration of the Kennedy presidency, which would include, in a certain sense, a restoration of the Jack Kennedy presidency. Mm -hmm. Yes, totally correct. All right, furthermore, in that year, we had very active students and young people involved in this. For the first time. Right. So we have, hopefully, the beginnings of that now. Yes, and so ever since 1968, when the, when the youth vote got activated and youth activism got activated for the very first time in a presidential campaign, it has been present in every campaign since. In the 1964 campaign, it was non-existent, and in campaigns prior to that, it was non-existent. And it has always been uh, on the left side of the Democratic Party, yeah. wherever that is mm -hmm. at, that, at any That's point in time. So we saw that last time around with Bernie Sanders and, uh, and Hillary Clinton. And Bernie Sanders was, if you're looking for the model, the Gene McCarthy model right. of 2016, the run on the left exactly. of the Democratic establishment. And whenever that happens, the Democratic establishment is the very last entity to realize that something important is happening. It's always at the beginning something dismissible. Right. Uh, so the Democratic Party establishment dismissed Gene McCarthy going to New Hampshire as utterly, utter folly and idiotic. And the, the, the polls indicated that they were right. So the, 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 but as, as the campaign in New Hampshire closed, they started to see, oh, this is serious. Same thing with Bernie Sanders started at 3% in the polls. And I, not thinking I was seeing the McCarthy model, yeah. and not thinking I was seeing the stimulus for a McCarthy model, looked at the Bernie Sanders campaign at 3% and said, well, uh, he'll probably go up to 6 It'll probably be like a Dennis Kucinich campaign. And Hillary Clinton it'll, will have this sort of fake opponent. Uh, who's in single digits so she can have debates and get some batting practice. That's all I thought I was seeing in Bernie Sanders for months. And then I started to see it move and I realized, oh, I'm completely wrong. Which, by the way, for me is a delight uh, because <laughs> politics usually is so predictable. It's a little like being a meteorologist in San Diego. And so, so when <laughs> snow comes to San Diego, the meteorologists are very Don't excited, <laughs> right? And so I started to realize, oh, Bernie Sanders is something other than what I, what I, thinking like the Democratic establishment, thought it was. Um, and so it, it was definitely that McCarthy surge. And I do, that, that's, that. But it was youth. also the narrowness of the issue. Yes, 1968 was life and death. Mm -hmm. The presidential campaign mm -hmm. was about life and death, and it was about War. and it was about the life and death of people we knew. It was about the uh, the, the lives and deaths of my older brothers, all of whom mm -hmm. had draft cards, all of whom were worried about were they going to be shipped off to Vietnam. It was about uh, the death of my cousin Johnny, who died mm -hmm. in 1968 in Vietnam, having graduated from West Point in 1967. So I'm going to my first military funeral in 1968, mm -hmm. along with over 16,000 other families in America mm. that year. year. 16,000 just in 1968. To compare that to the 21st century in Afghanistan and Iraq, you've had a total Small. of about 8,500 military funerals so in the United States over 16 years, 17 years. Uh, in, in one year of Vietnam, we had more than double everything well, that we've shows lost. the draft just brings the immediacy of a war. Yeah, the draft changed everything because the draft threatened everyone. If, if you didn't have right. a draft card in your pocket, in my case, my older brothers did, or your boyfriend did, or your, your father did, or your, mm -hmm. your you know, uh, fathers generally in those days, in the early stages, were, were exempt if they had children, uh, which is how Dick Cheney managed to get out of the draft. But, uh, but really everyone was living uh, mostly in fear of the draft. One of the great, you know, unspoken truths of America is that we are not a warrior nation. Most American men do everything they possibly can to avoid combat, 
to avoid combat, and they have succeeded. And so now that you have an all-volunteer army, it has become very, very clear that we are not a warrior nation. We have a we have one percent of our population that we sort of delegate war making to, and we we turn away from them and have no connection to them. It's incredible. Another thing in the thing was, as we talked about before, a president who didn't want to hear bad news, who was committed to the war, and therefore um, never realized the, condi the actual condition in, in Vietnam. So it's similar, I think, to Trump, who listen to any advice or anything, doesn't want to hear anything. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, presidents since, uh, since Johnson have mostly learned uh, the the mistake of Johnson, which was to which was to be in the the White House trying to manage a war in Southeast Asia himself, trying to overrule the generals, trying to pick bombing sites himself, and pushing away and pushing against any kind of bad news about Vietnam. Now, I have seen presidents do that in other subjects, including domestic policy. You know, the, the, the health care bill is not going well. Don't bring me that bad news. Tell me it's going well. I've, okay. I've seen that on domestic policy. Uh, but Johnson was doing it on a war. And so that inhibited everyone from the Secretary of uh, Defense right through the command structure in Vietnam. And sadly, they were all too inclined to mute their views or completely change their views to the truth that LBJ wanted away from the real mm -hmm. truth. It's terrible. So then we had a, um, a divided parties, a divided Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. It went into a convention, it was a disaster. We had police brutality, mm -hmm. <laughs> similar in a way that we have now, although we're trying not to. And we now have, I think, um, still a divided party, right? The Democratic Party? The Democratic Party has uh, identifiable factions. <clears throat> and I would say that is a, that's a healthier, or healthier organism than the Republican Party, which, has, which does not have factions. Which is totally changed. Now, change, in 19, right? 1968 was when that began. Mm -hmm. This book is filled with some kind of colorful New York characters, all of whom are Republicans. Uh, and that is, that's a very unusual thing. I mean, we now have a mm -hmm. New York Republican as, as president, uh, but not since that time have we seen anything like that because at the beginning of the campaign season, there were two New Yorkers who were, who were considered real possibilities. The governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller, Republican. The mayor of New York, John Lindsay, Republican. Uh, Lindsay was looking for a way to get on the vice presidential slot. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, of course, wanted the presidency himself. Nelson Rockefeller was considered a very serious threat uh, for the Republican nomination. He was a liberal Republican. John Lindsay was a liberal Republican. John Lindsay turned out to be the very last liberal Republican allowed to speak at a Republican convention. And the job he was given was to second the nomination of the vice presidential candidates, Spiro Agnew. Oh, but there has not been a liberal Republican on a Republican stage since. And so 1968 was the year that uh, Republicans uh, marked the death of liberalism in the Republican Party. Now, technically, literally, uh, about a dozen people had to have their careers die out or literally their mm -hmm. lives uh, at, for this to, to completely eliminate it. But we've now achieved, uh, and have achieved for quite a while now, complete purity. There is no such thing as a liberal Republican. And there used to be. In 1968, if someone said to you, I'm a Democrat, you did not know if that person was a liberal, a conservative, or a segregationist, uh, there was a whole range of possibilities. If, a per if someone said I was a Republican, you didn't know if that person was a liberal, or a conservative, or a segregationist, or, you know, you just did not know. Uh, and that, that purity of Republicanism began in 1968. Then we had um, the, the, um, the, the Democrats who then didn't vote for uh, Humphrey, right? Well, this is, it, it looks like in the polling that most of the Democrats came home to Humphrey. The, if there could have been, if there was, it was a little, such a close election, yeah, it was less than it was less than one percent. Uh, so Richard Nixon in 1960 lost the presidency by less than one percent. 1968, he comes <laughs> back and wins it by less than one percent. So what that means is, if you change anything, if you change anything in this campaign, uh, then Richard Nixon is not president. Uh, the idea that Bobby Kennedy couldn't have done 
uh, a half a percent better than Hubert Humphrey is, is literally laughable. Right. He would have right. done several points better yeah. than Hubert Humphrey. Uh, but Humphrey himself, if he had one more day, if he had one more day, he was closing, the lines were closing like this, and he, was, he really did catch up with Nixon. One of the big reluctances about Humphrey was that he was part of the Johnson war machine uh, in, the, in the view of the anti-war vote. But the anti-war vote had to make this difficult choice between two people, Nixon and Humphrey, who looked like they were pretty close uh, on mm -hmm. the war. Humphrey was clearly better on the war. He was clearly trying to turn away from it, but it was awfully hard at the voter level to hear those distinctions. Mm -hmm. And so those, a lot of those young McCarthy voters did not vote for Hubert Humphrey, even though, even though at the very last minute, Gene McCarthy asked them to. And that was the most difficult thing right. he had to do in the whole campaign. You know, we've come to the end of this half hour, but I wanted to ask you. I could go on and I on. I know you can. <laughs> do you think that, has there been a study in the, the electoral states that uh, Hillary lost of Democrats having not voted for her? Oh, sure. I mean, the... the so the, is that the, a similar thing also? Yes, the, the, it's a very similar thing. There was a, a, a move from Obama uh, to Trump in the key states that that switched that that threw the election to Trump, uh, and it was it was that kind of close and and actually uh, it had that oddity of the electoral college producing a different result from the total vote, which is very rare as we know it's only happened twice, and so uh, you know that was one of those things that is. is uh, what was avoidable with targeted campaigning in those in those districts because it was such a tiny margin. So we didn't even discuss Nixon and Johnson and the war. It really was collusion. <laughs> uh, Richard Nixon colluded uh, with South Vietnam to get them to not participate in peace talks that Lyndon Johnson was trying to start. So he was doing that, uh, violating the law by secretly colluding. Uh, the FBI caught him doing it. The CIA caught him doing it. Uh, President Johnson caught him doing it, but he realized um, there was nothing much he could do about it because there was only days before the election. And if he publicly accused Nixon of doing this, he felt it would look too political. Uh, but he had, uh, through the FBI and CIA surveillance, everything he needed to know what Nixon was up to. Well, I think our viewers can definitely tell why they have to read Playing With Fire because it's a great story. It's a suspense story, and you can't really put it down until you finished it. And I wish we could go much more. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great book. I oh, loved thank it. Thank you very much.